Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, this is a one hour webinar on pre results review in economics. Lessons learned from setting up a register reports in a couple of journals. With us today, we're very happy to have Andrew Foster, professor in the Department of Economics and Health Services Policy and Practice at Brown University. He's the editor, at, uh, he is, is the editor at Journal of Development Economics, has uh, implemented this process and will be uh, sharing lessons learned from that initiative. Ernie S. Wolf has a postdoc at the Department of Economics in the University of Constance. He has been the guest editor at the journal Experimental Economics, uh, also sharing experiences with setting up pre-results review uh, in, that, in that journal. And then finally, last but not least, Alexander um, Ognowski, Senior Program Associate at uh, the Berkeley Initiative for the Transparency and Social Sciences, will be giving tips and tricks and lessons learned from um, setting up a good uh, uh, author workflow, again, with uh, pre-results review equivalent to literature reports. My name is David Meller. I'm from the Center for Open Science, uh, we're a nonprofit organization located in Charlottesville, Virginia. Our mission is to increase transparency and reproducibility in scientific research through meta science, through advocacy, and through building infrastructure to enable the types of actions we want to see happen. I'm going to very quickly give a little bit of a definition and some disambiguations about some terms that are commonly thrown out. These practices occur in clinical research, in psychology, economics, other social sciences, and uh, there are some very similar terms that are sometimes used in slightly different ways. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, some disambiguation. When a researcher, uh, posts a pre-analysis plan, ideally to a registry that will become publicly available. That's defined as pre-registration. In clinical sciences, it's simply registering a trial or more precisely, prospective trial uh, registration. And those can and often should, I would say, include what's known, of course, as a pre-analysis plan. The purpose of which is to distinguish what was planned from what was reported in light of the data. When those proposed study plans are sent to a journal and have the prospect of being guaranteed publication regardless of the main outcome of the study. That's known as registered reports or in this format uh, equivalently known as pre-results review at a journal. Registration is mainly about submitting a study design to a registry designed to distinguish confirmatory versus exploratory research processes. Registered reports is that again, two-stage peer review process where these proposed study plans can be provisionally accepted by a journal before the results are known. And they have similar, but um, in some cases, different benefits to each other. Pre-registration and rich reports can both distinguish between confirmatory hypothesis testing and exploratory discoveries. It can, both of them can increase transparency into the process of the work and they can help to open the file drawer. When the journal is involved in both steps of the process that can help reduce publication bias and it can help improve study design by getting peer review at a point in the research workflow where design considerations can be addressed before the study is conducted. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it off to our first panelist, Andrew Foster. All right, so uh, so I just prepared some some notes. I understand I'm supposed to talk for about 50 minutes. Is that correct? That would be great. Yes. Okay, and you know, Alex should uh, feel free to correct everything I say that's wrong, since he knows uh, almost as much about all of this, or probably probably twice as much. Um, but um, let me just sort of start. Um, uh, with this sort of one of the questions always come up is like, why do we do this? Um, and I, you know, I think that the best answer is that that it really there are a lot of different things, and I think different uh, uh, those of us who were involved with the JD's uh, uh, pilot on registered reports, we had different motivations, um, uh, and the funders had motivations. I think the the LCV or the journal had motivations. Um, you know, for me, I I I I saw it as. Uh, a chance to get some good papers into the journal, um, sort of a much more specific. Uh, um, you know, I thought that there would be favorable selection. It was good advertising for the journal. It would sort of speak to my my colleagues' 
uh, in um, you know in development that the JD was paying attention to what people uh, were interested in, and this was clearly what a constituency was interested in, and so I so I thought it was a good opportunity to do that. Um, uh, so you know that's my sort of Machiavellian perspective, um, but I think you know I also understood the arguments. I think they're very good. Um, that um, you know that that open science, it's sort of the focus here, was really important. Uh, that pre you know pre result review had at least in principle the possibility of reducing the extent to which. Uh, people sort of undertook work that wasn't published. Um, certainly, the, I think the evidence on that in some, some places I think is quite strong. Um, I had always felt as an editor that I tried, I tried to take that perspective, uh, regardless of whether it's pre-results or review, that I should evaluate a paper based on the nature of the question and the nature of the design and pay less attention uh, to the results. But I also understood that, that wasn't, the fact that I did that wasn't so uh, apparent to authors and referees, and there may have been a, a fair bit of censoring that would happen even before we got a hold of it, or the referee comments might be more focused on the results than I might be comfortable with. I think another motivation was we really wanted to spur, especially young faculty, to take on work uh, that was more creative, that uh, perhaps with the less risk of coming up with an unpublishable uh, a result of one, si of one type or another, uh, they might be willing to take on something and they could be rewarded fairly early in the pipeline in the form of a prospective publication and therefore keep them from uh, sort of, uh, you know, waiting to do their best work until they're, they have tenure. Um, so those were kind of the, the, this, the sort of the set of things that came together um, that, uh, that sort of made this happen. In terms of sort of, you know, what happened, our, we received our first publication, our first submission. Um, so we, you know, it turned out to be fortuitous that Right at the same time we were interested in doing this, Elsevier uh, was rolling out a new platform that had registered reports built in. And so I saw this as kind of an opportunity to kind of, so as soon as that platform came out in 2018, uh, we started accepting registered reports as part of this pilot. Um, it, you know, I can, I now look at the records. We, we've moved on to another platform, but it still retained that. Um, we've received 172 publications um, uh, through that since February 18. Okay. Now it turns out about half of those were, were mistargeted. Okay. So there's a special field that you're supposed to fill in, uh, you know, pre-results review. Um, and then there's a second field you're supposed to do if it's a, if it's a, it's a phase two uh, submission. Uh, but in fact, some people pick those things with papers that have nothing to do with registered reports um, or they start submitting and they don't. So I would say about half of the 172 are just mistakes. Okay. So, you know, then you're down um, uh, to sort of 70 or so. And of those about uh, or 50 of those went out to referees. Okay. Now we normally uh, reject um, uh, 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 sort of about 25% of the papers that are submitted uh, go out to referees. So this is a much higher rate than we would normally get. Now, some of that is because I think the favorable selection, the people who were sort of attuned to what we were doing were sort of a little bit sort of uh, more experienced and so forth, I think. Um, but also we were a little bit more flexible. Um, I think we, we felt like uh, that um, we, we should, particularly as a pilot, we should be a little bit more generous if somebody was going to try this out because we wouldn't know what a good one was and what a bad one was. So let's start and be fairly flexible. And Dean Carlin, who is my co-conspirator here, uh, was very much willing to take on more than his share as a result of that. Um, the, the, the rate of submission has been really quite steady. Um, I looked at a histogram of that. It's been about two to four months, uh, two to four per month, uh, you know, since February 18. Um, there seems to be a peak um, mid-summer. Um, we've seen it sort of been higher in mid-summer, lower in other periods. We presume that has to do with the academic calendar. I'm not yet seeing a peak this time around. I'm guessing it's because, you know, field trial work is in such trouble <laughs> in general and people are not sure what to plan. Um, so, so anyway, so that's the, so, so, but it's been fairly steady and, you know, I was worried that maybe it would sort of peter out after the original excitement, but it really hasn't been the case. I think if they're just kind of, uh, sort of flowing in, um, you know, I think, uh, Alex and, and Ted have been you know, pretty good about pushing out things like this, uh, to sort of keep it on the front of the radar of people and maybe, and I think that's probably helpful. Um, but I, I think it's nice to see that that it's just sort of continued on. It hasn't sort of accelerated to something unmanageable, but it hasn't dropped off to zero either. Um, in terms of our current status, um, that of the phase one, we have um, uh, sort of in the current status, we have uh, two accepts, 28 rejects, and 12 under revision in phase one, okay? 
And then in the phase two, um, um, sort of on top of that, we have two accepts and two under review. So, you know, by and large, you know, over what, uh, you know, now um, uh, uh, since uh, February 18, we sort of produced uh, essentially, you know, four, four papers. Again, probably it will be like, you know, four papers a year, I would say, uh, going forward in steady state, which is exactly where we'd like it. We don't want it to get much bigger because not everything is suitable for that, but we think that's a, that's, I think it's a good, good pace. Mostly there are RCTs that we're getting. Um, we've sort of talked about prospective observational studies, but, but that's not been sort of the kinds of submissions we've seen. Most of them, I say, are RCTs. There have been a, a couple of cases where people submitted uh, uh, pre-results uh, uh, review papers, or registered reports um, for observational data that had already been collected. And originally we were taking that kind of data, um, but uh, sort of along the way we decided that was just too complicated because it was sort of, um, you know, the problem is someone would submit something and if the data was already collected, they would sort of start analyzing it. And it was difficult for them to commit for the three to four months um, of not looking at the data before we actually got back to them with comments, right? Whereas if somebody has a planned data collection in four months, then we kind of have a deadline and everything seems to work better. So it's just cleaner that way. But it would work with prospective observational studies. It's just to say we haven't had those. Topic-wise, it hasn't been restricted. It's been all over the map. Human you know, health, uh, agriculture, credit, all the different kinds of things that development economists uh, look at. And as I said earlier, we definitely are getting, at least in the initial stage, more seasoned authors, not necessarily sort of the most senior people, um, but uh, sort of more the sort of, you know, mid-raise, maybe they are, you know, tenured at, or, um, at the cusp of 10 or 15 to 25 ranked departments are sort of the mode. Um, uh, so they're sort of, you know, upper tier, but not the sort of top tier of the people who submit to the journal in general. Okay. In terms of my own thoughts, um, you know, I think one of the best or my own thoughts and experiences, the referees have been very willing to help out. I think that partly reflects the spirit of development and people kind of get what we're doing. Um, one of the things we've had gone round and round, and I'm glad that David, you mentioned this, is that we have to go back and back and forth with the authors that, about the difference between a pre-analysis plan and pre-results review. You know, people say, I'm gonna submit my pre-analysis plan. No, or we've already submitted one, is that enough? And no, that's not right either. So, so that's been a, been a major sort of education. I think people are beginning to get it. I think the, the, one of the surprise lessons for us is that at least for me, as, as I said, I had tried always to try to focus on the design of the paper um, and not on the results. But I think the referees found, and I think even as an editor, we found that it was harder to judge than we expected. And I think one of the key issues is power, okay? That when you have results, regardless of whether it's, a, you know, whether it's significant or not significant, at least you get some sense of how tight the standard errors are. Now, people in, in pre-results review do these power calculations, but you know, my feeling is that the machinery we have for power calculations is, is really, really poor when it comes to the kinds of study that development economists do. There's sort of covariance that matter. There's the variance within clusters and across clusters. All of these things are guesses, right? And so in the end, you can't, based on a pre-analysis plan, get any idea how precise your estimate is going to be ex post. And so when you have, and that's one of the issues that we face, and we have to just, you know, judge based on imperfect calculations. So that's been something we've I've thought about a bit. Um, the complexity of data collection time for pre-review is really important, right? I mean, people are in a hurry when they submit the pre-review. They're, they're maybe have, are in at sort of midline stage of an RCT. They want the result, you know, they want to learn what the story is before it comes in. But our referees, you know, like to take their whatever, the three months that they have. And so, you know, that, and the co-editors were busy people and sometimes there are delays there. So we've tried to push them along a little faster and we have been successful in that regard. But review process takes time, and that's a barrier. That's a problem sometimes. Um, I, you know, I want to say that Elsevier has been incredibly supportive through this process. Um, they've really allowed us to do this. And you know, one of the big issues was could we allow people to submit papers that have been accepted for pre-review in phase one uh, to another journal? Uh, we wanted that to be the case because we didn't want to have people, you know, avoiding us because they thought the paper might be too good. Um, and they've been, they've accepted that. Um, and, you know, we've had a, you had a test case. It seems to be fine. Other journals seem to be okay with that. So uh, I think that's something to watch, but so far it hasn't been a problem. And, you know, the only thing I can say is that Elsevier did have this registered reports uh, module, um, which we thought was really cool, but it didn't actually do anything, right? It wasn't as well thought through as, you know, it, it would have been if I had done it 
uh, you know, if we had really sort of thought of what we needed. I mean, one of the things we sort of learned is phase one and phase two aren't actually really linked together. So you can't accept a phase one, you have to send a revision for a phase one, which isn't a very natural thing to do. Um, and that confuses authors. It confused, uh, you know, Dean at one point too. And we had a, a quite a big mess that took us about a year to unwrap. <laughs> Okay, and then the final thing is that we do see there's some problem of a, of a moral of moral hazard and revision when people are doing the phase two. You know, maybe their incentives, at least initially, aren't quite what they would be if they if they didn't already have a in principle acceptance in their in their pockets. I don't know that that's a big problem, and people the authors have been responsive. We said, look, you just didn't do enough here, um, but it could be a problem down the road. In terms of future plans, you know, I think the big thing for us is a lot of field work is either suspended or has a rapid turnaround right now because it's COVID related. And that, you know, the rapid turnaround we can't handle in pre-results review. Um, the suspension is probably going to cut into the number of people doing the kind of work that fits here. Um, you know, I think we want to encourage submissions of the right kind, the publicity and talking to people and keeping it on the, you know, on the uh, front burner, I think is important. Um, and I think there's been some discussion about partner, you know, possible partnerships with project funders. There was some discussion about NSF and so forth. Is there any way we could kind of integrate the journal review with a with proposal review? Uh, I think that's kind of too complicated for me, but it's certainly been something on the table. So let me stop there. Thank you so much for those comments and, and the uh, sort of big picture overview of, of what you like, what you've seen. The uh, I. I forgot a couple of housekeeping notes uh, before I introduce you. Everybody feel free to submit questions. There's a little Q&A button. Um, most of those will be held towards the end and we'll make sure to have plenty of time for Q&A. And I also wanna remind folks that this uh, webinar is being recorded and we'll make it available for, um, for sharing afterwards. Um, with that, I will pass the baton to Aranius. Would you please share your screen and provide your insight, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, is this, yeah, should be on now, right? Yep. Are you seeing it? Yeah, perfect. So um, some of this is going to be repeating what, what Andrew already um, said. So this is, this is our experiences at the, this experimental economics symposium, which was planned as a pilot um, that should not fill a full special issue that therefore we called it a symposium. Um, it was initially targeted at um, having five to seven articles. We won't quite get there, but I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, what I'm going to say is, is mainly focused on the, on the questions that, um, that the, the COS um, put in front of me. And so um, there's going to be some slides with a lot of contents and um, one slide without contents because I, I don't have much to say on that. Um, that said, let's start. So the first question is, what was the motivation for implementing? And there's, of course, as, as Andrew said, there's um, different levels here. Um, it's the question of, of um, what the motivation was for us, and then what the motivation was for the journal. So for us, we had, of course, publication bias in, in the center, um, together with, with the file drawer problem that, that was brought up already, and the incentive for writing up papers that, that um, don't produce um, exciting, um, super strong results. Um, that was the main, um, the main focus, but of course there's a lot of side effects, positive side effects. One would be the better targeted use of resources. So if you're the 20th person to try to demonstrate an inexistent relationship, that's bad. Um, and you're only going to do that because there's 19 others that you don't know about. Um, sometimes you try and, and follow up um, on a paper that was a false positive, and then we all know if you if you um, if you can't reproduce the the original results, you have a much harder time publishing that. Um, so it usually takes probably five to six papers to correct one false positive. Um, yeah, bad design choices can be spotted more often and earlier. That was mentioned already as well. Um, not just by referees, but also by the authors who have to think um, more carefully about, about their own studies um, because they have to really put everything down in detail. Um, acquiring funds might be easier for young researchers if they have a pre-acceptance already. They can go to the, to the funding agencies 
and say, look, um, I have this, this is going to be published, no matter what comes out, wouldn't you give me the funds? Um, it, at the first sight, it might seem like it requires much more effort, um, but maybe that's not true because it does require a lot of more, uh, so much more effort in terms of before running uh, the pay or, or the, the um, experiment, of course, but after that, after you have the pre-acceptance, you no longer have the need to rewrite your paper time and again to fit a jur different journal. So kind of in, gen in, in, in total, you might have the same workload or even less potentially. And then there's a, a theory paper by, by Martin Duffenberg who first proposed this, uh, such a mechanism already in 2007, um, together with, with Peter Martinson that came out in 2019. And they um, focus on the incentives to cheat in terms of producing your own data or p-hack or, or any of that um, sort. Um, another positive side effect that I see and that um, I think hasn't been implemented so far in economics is that in principle we can go back to double blind review again. Because I mean we abolished that in, in economics because you can always Google the, the um, working papers that are out and you already know the, the um, authors of the study. Um, but now nobody's going to um, publish their proposals. So in principle it would be feasible and, and potentially sensible to go back to double blind review. Um, when we proposed this to, to experimental economics, um, they were not as enthusiastic as we were. They did see the, the positive effects of this and also said, because of that, we want to give it a try. Um, but of course, there were uh, a number of reservations um, that, um, so, so they were a bit more hesitant than, than we were in the beginning. And I don't know what the state is there. Um, maybe we find out a little bit later um, in the conversation. Um, here's some buts that came up or that, that come up. And th this is not um, all from the experimental board. This is that buts that come up time and again if you talk about pre-results review. Um, first of all, some people say there will be no submissions. There are no incentives for submitting. First of all, low quality ideas. You have to, you have to put in a lot of effort um, in order to, to get your pre-acceptance. Uh, so you won't spend that much effort on a low quality idea. However, for a high quality idea, unless you have the terms that the JDE has in terms of the, allowing you to go and, and first try the AER um, and, and then come back if, if the AER rejects the paper, um, but if you have the, the terms that we have at, the, um, that at Experimental Economics, um, then you might not get the high quality um, submissions because people might want to save them for, for having their chance at the AER, right? Um, so uh, another um, issue was that people might use the, the pre-registration, um, sorry, the, the pre-results review um, as a cheap improvement device. So you have a, a, a nice idea, but you don't want to spend too much time on thinking about the design. So you send it to, to the journal and let the, um, the referees improve your design. I, I mean, in, in, in the end, it's going to be a, an empirical question, like most of the, these questions. Um, but uh, the question is, how cheap is it really? So, so if you already spend time to write it all up and, and you have to put in a lot of effort to, to match the, um, the requirements for, for a proposal, right? Um, as Andrew was mentioning, um, there, so, so we, we didn't have this experience, the experience that we had to reject papers because the, pre uh, the, the proposals were not proposals in the sense that we wanted them. Um, so they were mostly of the format that we wanted them and that we, we had expected. In that sense, kind of experimenters in, in experimental economics seem to be um, closer to the idea in some sense. Um, but given they have to, to put in so much effort, the question is whether a, a, um, a submission um, just for, for improvement um, is really so cheap. Um, there has been the question of whether there is really need for registered reports in lab research because you can always go back 
to the lab and, and rerun your study um, if you don't find a result or whatever. Well, that of course does not solve the file drawer problem, right? So that's, in, in that sense, I, I don't see how, how there's no need. And, and if you look at psychology where it's at least as easy to rerun a study, they have hundreds of journals implementing registered reports. Um, so the question is, why would that be an argument against uh, registered reports in, in experimental economics? Um, question is, what, another question that has been asked is, won't people try to cheat? Well, if we talk about faking data or p-hacking data, we know that incentives are reduced. So there's this paper by, by Duffenberg and Martinson. Um, and it's, it's pretty obvious that that's the case because you no longer have to produce um, um, stunning result, uh, results um, because it's, it's all about the question. Um, how about submitting after obtaining a null result? That, of course, by the, by the rules laid out um, in our call is fraud. Right? If, you, if you try and, and submit your, your study after having um, gotten the data, you don't talk about this, you don't talk about your, your prior experiments and then try to sell it as the, the final thing. Of course, that runs the risk because probably referees are going to have some, some um, improvement um, um, suggestions for for this for the the experiment itself so you will have to change it and in that sense I don't see that this is a large uh, danger either another question will there be a seniority bias problem maybe especially if you do this whole thing without double-blind review of course it's still an empirical question one that we can not answer so far because we haven't had the numbers um, there may or there may, may not be judging by what we got. Um, will there be low quality work at stage two? Andrew was always, already saying they, there might be a slight tendency for that. On the other hand, of course, there's, there's also um, the review at stage two, so you can't, you can't just, just not do what you promised. Um, and then finally, there was the, the question of, of we'll, we'll be publishing too many uninteresting results. And um, I mean, if, if we look at the, at the numbers that Andrew just presented with four papers a year, that doesn't seem like there's, um, there, there would be more than, than the share of uninteresting results um, than, than other journals would, would have. So in that sense, that's to the bots. Our, our submissions, what do we receive? So this, oh, I should be saying this was, yeah, I, I think I said this. But the setting is a bit different than at, at the JDE because we had, uh, this is about a symposium, so this has to come out at a set date. So we also had a set deadline for, for submission, right? And we had, I think, um, some eight to 10 months prior to, to the deadline um, when we announced that. So the number of submissions is about two, two plus. Uh, we had 21 submissions um, for this. Um, there was a second, 22nd in the making. They asked us whether they could still submit. We said, no, that's past the deadline, and it's, it's too much past the deadline anyway, so, so we, we refused that. Uh, topics was Topic-wise, it was very broad, perhaps even more than what you'd uh, expect for standard submissions. The authors, there were 27 authors for these 21 submissions, and there were three to six, depending on how you see it, with what I'd call keynote status, so, so that's people that we would uh, potentially invite for, for a keynote speech at our um, local workshop. Um, so however you want to judge that. Uh, referee recommendations so far and decisions. So we, we didn't have, so we, we had final decisions. Um, we had 90% rejects, um, both in terms of, of um, recommendations by authors and in terms of, of decisions. And that matches exactly the, the experimental economics standard, so to speak. Um, we have three revise and resubmit decisions, and two of them have keynote authors on board. So in that sense, there might be a seniority bias. There may not be. We don't know. So the numbers are very low um, and hard to judge from that. Um, what was not received that you'd like to see more of? Um, I don't have to say much on this. 
Um, so we would have ha liked to have uh, more paper and more publishable papers, of course, um, but that's, that's what we got. Um, knowing what I know now, what advice would I give to others considering this format? Well, st I would still say do it. Um, try double-blind review. I think that's, that's sensible and that should get rid of the seniority bias problem. Um, you should, might want to consider the, the JDE terms in terms of um, allowing people to, to go to the AER first. We had the idea that you, you do this um, um, with kind of when you submit that you agree to, to cite the call for papers that was published in experimental economics. So experimental economics would at least have some benefit from um, being kind of a, um, a step uh, holder for, for the AR. Um, but but it, then again, that's like a quality insurance um, uh, stamp that you put on, um, and, and that's, that's a sensible reason not to do it this way. So that, that was just um, our idea back then, um, that you could or you could not um, uh, consider. And then, of course, use the wealth of materials that are available, and they're just, yeah, they were very impressive, and, and we benefited so much from, from what was there already um, that the work was, was really reduced. And, and perhaps also that made it easier for us to, to get the kind of submissions that we were expecting. One thing that I forgot to say now, um, and that's not on my slides, is in terms of refereeing, um, we've had about 50% um, of people accepting to review. Um, I don't know what the what the standard at experimental economics is. Um, we had hoped that that would be that would be higher, um, but yeah, that's that's how it was. And I think that's everything I had to say. Oh no no no! Future plans, of course. Um, push for perpetuating the the um, our uh, registered report submission option at the at experimental economics. Also, in light of of kind of the fact that it seems like. Judging by the JDE experience, um, it's not overwhelming what you get uh, in terms of uh, numbers, um, but it's also something that seems to be um, that that some people really really um, would like to see, and and we've had a lot of comments in that vein. Um, and then of course ask additional journals to introduce it um, in the field. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. And I hand over to Alex. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to share we have two questions. Keep those coming in, and we'll make sure to um, address those at the end. Alex, would you be happy to take the baton now? Uh, yes. Just a second. I'm trying to. OK. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks to you and to Claire and for your colleagues at the Center for Open Science for hosting this webinar and for inviting us to share our experience with registered reports. Um, my, name is, my name is Alexander Bogdanovsky. I'm a senior program associate at the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in the Social Sciences. And in my presentation, I want to reflect a bit more on the operational pers uh, perspective of the process on how to make peer results re review or registered reports work. First, a few words about BITS, the organization that I'm representing. Um, BITS is an initiative of the Center for Effective Global Action, which is a UC Berkeley-based hub on research development, on uh, research hub on international development. Uh, we work to promote ethical, transparent, and reproducible research practices as means of improving the integrity of science. Um, we do this by uh, conducting and supporting um, meta research. We do this by providing access to uh, open science education and let me here uh, advertise our ongoing call for application for our research transparency and reproducibility training or rt2 which is taking place at um, september 21st to 25th you can find details on our website and finally uh, we work with um, various actors throughout the scientific ecosystem to uh, help them adopt policies and research protocols to support open science so we started working with the JD uh, in March 2018. Given that this was a, a novelty in the discipline, we decided to first introduce registered reports as a pilot 
and the pilot ran between March and uh, 2018 and, and November 2019. Um, Andy spoke that it was the the the, the pilot was uh, an overwhelming success. We received uh, plenty of submissions uh, and and acceptances. But you know, I, I want to take you a little bit behind the scenes and and tell you how we made that happen. So, in preparation of the pilot, we surveyed the editors of the journals that um, accepted registry reports. Uh, back at the end of 2017, there were roughly 70 of those. Uh, I, I think there are over 250 journals accepting registry reports these days, which speaks of the exponential growth of of the of the format across the disciplines. And based on the uh, feedback from uh, journal editors, we, real, we learned that among the biggest challenges that they faced were the low number of submissions. Uh, the other panelists spoke about that. And then the very few, uh, the very few submissions that they did receive varied highly in terms of their structure and their quality. So it was sort of apparent that um, authors weren't it wasn't particularly clear to authors what a stage one register report submission should look like. From the author's perspective, obviously, uh, going into a new discipline, uh, we faced the challenge of relatively low familiarity with pre results review, so we had some uh, educating to do. And then we recognized that there are higher upfront costs for preparing manuscripts in this uh, track compared to uh, conventional uh, to manuscripts in conventional peer review. So to address these things, we developed a series of author and editorial guide, uh, resources. One of these are the author for uh, guidelines for authors. We use the Center for Open Science uh, generic te template, template guidelines to um, get us started on this. However, we, made, we adapted it in order to fit the disciplinary focus of the journal, but then also to introduce a little bit more flexibility at stage two. I'll talk about a little more about that later. In addition to the guidelines, uh, to further clarify and provide examples, bring them closer to authors and reviewers, we developed sets of frequently asked questions. So these were largely informed by questions that we would get asked every time we spoke about this. And then probably the most interesting item in the uh, package of materials that we developed was the stage one submission template. So this includes a series of questions and pointers that authors can answer in order to come up with a complete stage one register report. Just to give you a general idea of what this looks like, this is not the actual template. However, this is um, a submission checklist that includes uh, all the items found in the template. So you can, you can see that um, there are some of the formatting requirements mandated by the journal, but then we also have um, pointers for how to report the importance of the research question, the research design, data collection strategy, um, empirical analysis, et cetera. Beyond putting out these resources, as I said, since this was breaking gr new ground in a new discipline, uh, we, had, we re understood that it was very important to spread the word about this. So we did targeted outreach and promotion. We used um, quarterly blog posts targeting the most prominent media outlets in the development economics. We sent emails to authors who had pre-registered prospective uh, experiments at the AARCT registry, which is the go-to registry in economics. And as I said, we gave presentations such as this one to promote and help, the, help spread the word out. And finally, in addition to all these things, um, we hosted a help desk. So this was essentially me trying to, my, to the best of my ability uh, to answer to um, questions from authors, received roughly 90, in uh, questions from from different authors during during the pilot phase, um, which kind of tells us that authors didn't need a, quite a bit of support in the initial stages of of the process. So, if you're an editor and are interested in bringing your bringing registry reports to your journal, you can do so in uh, six steps that. Uh, we, we identify these based on our experience and they may be relevant to other journals in particularly in economics. First of all, decide the scope of adoption. So is this going to be a pilot like we did initially with JD or is, it a, is this going to be just a part of a special issue? For example, the way experimental economics is, is doing this will 
largely influenced the 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 amount of effort that uh, adopting registry reports will um, mandate from 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 the editorial team. Then appoint a, uh, an editor who's going to be mostly focused on handling submissions in this uh, this track, and then also identify a roster of reviewers. Ideally, these will this will be folks who are already familiar with pre registration and pre analysis plans and can provide constructive feedback to prospective prospective work. Then Andy talked about this, uh, and it's it's very helpful to have. Um, an editorial platform that supports a two-step peer review process that it will carry over um, the correspondence and, and peer review feedback from stage one into stage two. But then, even if if this is not the play, this is not in place at, at your journal, um, there are ways to work around it just the way we did. And the mo most importantly, prepare author guidelines. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Obviously, the, the Center for Open Science generic guidelines and, and the materials that we put out are a great place to start. Uh, potentially, a few I, I, I want to talk about a few interesting editorial uh, policy editorial points that, that um, might, uh, might be consequential in this regard. So first of all, think in terms of the data and research design eligibility. So are you only going to accept experiments if you're, for example, accepting um, secondary analysis of existing data? Um, how are you going to ask authors to verify that they haven't looked at the data beforehand? So this is all important. Um, articulate evaluation criteria for stages one and two. As I said, uh, we understood based on experience in the, in the discipline that authors probably needed a bit more flexibility at stage two. So uh, we had to uh, modify the evaluation criteria a little bit to allow for that. Then think of in terms of the, think about the timeline to submit relative to data collection. So at what point, how, 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 how early before starting to collect data uh, must authors submit? Based on the uh, experience at the JD, we, we found that Roughly four months before collecting any follow-up data is uh, recommended. However, uh, having some sort of data, for example, baseline data for with uh, field experiments is useful to understand the study context and conduct some uh, power calculations. Um, consider how you're going to ask authors to report and evaluate the uh, re report deviation at stage two. So. We we noticed that a lot of the journals in uh, other disciplines explicitly asked that authors ask for permission from the editor before moving on with uh, before deviating from the uh, stage one submission that was accepted at, uh, it, that was granted in principle acceptance. The JD, as I said, since we're dealing with exper uh, field experiments and a lot of things may go uh, out of control. We opted with with a more flexible solution where authors can deviate, but they need to um, transparently report everything and justify it in their stage two submission. Uh, moving down the list, again, submitting to other journals after being granted in principal acceptance uh, is another interesting issue that uh, both Andy and Iranius talked about. So I'm, I'm just going to skip that. Um, designating Papers published in, in, in PR in peer results review it might give an additional incentive for authors to submit the, uh, their work in this uh, track. So, for example, the system of a system of badges or or some sort of a a, a special designation to signal that this uh, uh, papers in this uh, track underwent thorough peer review. After you all do all that you should appoint a contact person to answer questions from, from authors. As I said, um, in our case, uh, authors did require a significant amount of support, at least in, during the pilot phase. And then finally, once you have all this in place, uh, the cherry on the top, set a launch date and develop a, an outreach strategy. So it's very important to spread the word out. Uh, think of what the most prominent outlets in your disciplines are. So think the blogs and the newsletters that people read and try to get on those. And finally, consider the familiarity with pre-registration and pre-analysis plans of authors in your discipline. This will mandate how much support authors will require. So if 
you're interested in, if you're a, a, a journal editor and are interested, particularly in economics, and are interested in bringing the um, free results of registered reports to your journal, um, we have made all of the materials available at jd slash free results review dot org. Uh, they are free to use with uh, attribution to uh, bits and the JD. And then uh, feel free to get in touch with me if you're an author or, or an editor with any questions or suggestions. Yeah. Thank you. Alex, thank you so much for uh, providing that, that insight and that overview. We do have uh, four questions and if more come in, we'll make sure to get to them. But I wanted to uh, go through those and give you all the opportunity to, to address them. I'd be happy to chime in if there are opportunities for that opinion, but let's go down the list. Um, Paul asks for you, Andrew Foster. Um, authors, you said that they had the, retained the right after first stage acceptance to send the paper to another journal. If yes, doesn't that make it more likely that Journal of Development Economics publications through this channel would be predominantly null or small effects, um, which are traditionally harder to get into top journals? So, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, in, in, you know, in principle, that's possible. I'd say two things. First, you know, we, we feel that our, our role is to, um, is to serve the field. And, you know, so when our author asked us recently, uh, you know, wanted to make sure that this was really our policy and we actually wished him good luck in his submission to a higher rank journal. Um, because, in, you know, if that's published, you know, that's, that's good for the field. Um, but I should also say that we do, um, you know, part of the sort of registry report contract for us is that something gets published in the electronic version of the journal, which says that this paper was withdrawn either because it was never completed or because it was submitted to another journal. So there is actually an archival record within the JDE that this paper uh, is published elsewhere. So we're not, you know, obviously competing with the AR in a case like that, but there is a record. And so that's what we think is important. And, and you know, in some sense, you know, whether we get credit or not really doesn't matter. But if someone looks in the JD, they'll see that this was a, that this phase one acceptance does have a result. And we aim to keep it that way. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. It's it, scientifically, it's, it's a, it doesn't matter as long as the, the results are disseminated. Um, and I think it remains to be seen how often authors will go down that route. Um, I think there'll be some, you know, a little bit of obligation to the journal, especially for having gone through the, the pre-results review process. Um, but, you know, if there's an extraordinarily surprising result that, that could be, you know, uh, dis disseminated elsewhere, uh, that's, that's not necessarily bad. And it's, you know, of course, the, uh, the journal helped make that happen in, in the first place. Some journals have published these, um, you know, after stage one acceptance, it published the protocol, and that's something that could be cited. Uh, a couple of journals do do that. I, I don't think any in economics do that at the moment. Um, um, and, and of course, a lot of authors are, you know, concerned about that as well, because it would be uh, an earlier publication. So sometimes those can be embargoed. So there are a couple of different ways to um, to look into that. I'm not sure if anybody else has any opinions or experience with that, or if anybody's actually seen one of these be published elsewhere yet. Um, I, I know it's been a, a question for a couple of years, but I haven't seen um, that occur to my knowledge. Yeah. All right, we'll go into the second question here. Uh, from Victor, if only a small percentage of studies can use registration, I think that was um, Andrew from your example about our focus on RCTs. How much does this do to improve science or is it exactly the problematic part of the studies? Um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I, yeah, I think science gets improved one step at a time. Uh, and so I think, you know, if there's a set of a class of studies that are better uh, as a result of this, science is improved. And, you know, I'm not trying to change the world here. Um, I, I have a sense that within my field, uh, that there's a recognition of the value of this. And, and if, if, us, if us doing that, you know, causes the field to be a little bit better, that seems enough. Now, obviously, you know, if, if this webinar has, I think, what its desired effect, 
what we did in the JD will actually have bigger legs and will actually have a larger impact. But that's not why I did it. And we do know, and I don't have um, sort of a summary at my fingertips amongst what's been published amongst many disciplines so far. Um, but certainly the format can be applied beyond RCTs or beyond field experiments. Um, I, I think it's particularly well suited to those for a variety of reasons. A, a lot of this um, was sort of designed with a randomized controlled trial in mind, but it's applicable to certainly to any hypothesis testing research, particularly null hypothesis significance testing, if, if that's um, important to the inference of the study a journal would be well put to, to consider that as a submission. Um, but I think a lot of journals taking this up for the first time are, I, I think for decent reasons, focusing on a certain set of studies just to experiment, gain experience, develop best practices, and depending on how the fields evolve, um, I think the, the future will be different. We'll just see how many um, different design types would be appropriate for the, for the format. Um, anonymous writes, um, are the, uh, and we kind of got to this in a couple of different answers, but are the, P, are the PRRs normally published so that authors and reviewers can see concrete examples of how such a report looks like? Um, so, short answer, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the um, the, the answer is they wouldn't sort of normally pub be published, but some are published. We're actually, but they're not published in the journal. We actually are maintaining a, 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 a website uh, that is sort of separate from the JD because we just, you know, dealing with that would have been too complicated uh, that Dean Carlin's output put together. It's quite an elegant um, thing and it tracks the, the phase one submissions. It has examples of successful ones. It has the templates that Alex made. Um, and it has a user interface that Dean and I can access and so we can update things. You know, one thing that we, you know, one sort of interesting sort of anecdote is that in one case, the author wanted to be sure that we wouldn't publish uh, details of the, of the PR because he was concerned that his subjects might actually read it <laughs> and it would change their behavior, right? And so, so, you know, I don't know how legitimate that concern was. Uh, thank you, uh, David, for putting it up there. Um, but, but, you know, I think the idea that that we would like to get you know, those things available through the web, uh, through that website, but, um, but it's really up to authors what they want to re release, when they want to release it. We just wanted to make sure we had a track record so we could sort of answer questions like how many were submitted and what was the status. Yeah, I think it's a really valuable resource too to, to see um, what's been accepted and it really gives a, a good insight, a good, Good registry, basically. Yeah, we generally ask the authors, right? You know, can we make this available to other, other reviewer, other people? So we're not doing that at the at experimental economics, but in some sense, I I don't see much of a need because, as 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 you said, the templates are there, um, and what we received looked pretty much what like what we expected. So that was that was good. <laughs> Um, I'll share a link in a moment to uh, sort of some similar registries with other journals, but let's move on. So you're not just watching me look through, through uh, my bookmarks there. Yep. Uh, Viola asks, uh, Andrew again at JEDE mentioned that it's often difficult to judge the power of a study. There's a, I think that's an understatement. Could you maybe give examples of how authors can do really well in describing their pow power calculations? Well, I mean, there's the stuff you teach in statistics class, and you know, I think that's okay. I mean, uh, my inclination, what I you know always recommend my, my students, is to actually you know construct a data generating process, simulate out the data, um, and run the regressions you're going to run, right? Um, and um, and so I think you know at least when you do that, you're explicit about what your assumptions are. Um, you could even provide the data code of the simulation, for example, um, so that uh, that people could see it and play around with it if they wanted. So I've never seen that done. It just came to me just now. So, <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, I do think this power issue is something that we want to think about, you know, long term on this. And, and, uh, but I think a lot of it is unanswerable questions because it relies on stuff that we just don't know in a particular context. Yeah, and after results are known, you, uh, it, it might 
be tempting at that point to, to of course, use that for what turns out to be a post hoc power analysis, which, you know, does at least give you some, um, <laughs> it, it feels like it's better because you've got some, uh, uh, you know, something to sink your teeth into and it seems a little bit more precise. I, uh, I, I should say it is problematic. You sometimes get, but we often get, in fact, the majority of the cases have been people that where they've already conducted a baseline. So at least when you have conducted a baseline, you have some sense of what you know the the correlations are in the in the at least the covariates or other variables. So you get a little bit better sense of of what thing you know what sort of the the residual is going to look like, even though you haven't treated it. Now, obviously, if it's a treatment heterogeneity issue or treatment interacts, that's not going to help you. But at least that's a basis on which to make a power calculation or power simulation, as I suggested. Yeah, and I would like to uh, put out. Uh, a common warning, but just uh, as a public service announcement, uh, <laughs> don't be tempted to uh, use the results of a very small pilot study for uh, the basis of a power calculation yes. because that's a very small, yes. unrepresentative sample. Yeah, um, we often would advocate for split sample designs, um, but th this does get a little bit more complicated with the pre-results review. Um, but sometimes uh, a method would be to collect a large sample size, randomly divide half of it, and do lots of exploratory or design work, power calculations on, on half of the data, and hold off analyzing or even opening that second half of the data set um, for, for later confirmatory work. Of course, now it's a little bit more complicated with, with journals if you, if you want to get that pre-results review in there. Um, so it's not, uh, it's a check with the particular journal you're, you're working with. If, if you're tempted by that feature. But, um, but that's something that um, is well known in machine learning and AI research, for example. Um, Emma reminds folks, thinking beyond RCTs, there are 84 journals that offer registered reports for meta-analyses um, and the format fits them well. I'm gonna put in a link to uh, the COS website with registered reports that has information about um, journals that offer it across several different disciplines and there's a table there also that uh, mentions some of these issues about journals that do offer it for existing data sets or meta-analyses or other. So if you're interested in learning more there, there's some background. Okay, Jeffrey asked, and uh, I should mention we have three more minutes so we'll get through as many questions as possible, but to respect everybody's time, we will be ending in about three minutes to so just stuff. Uh, um, We've already talked a little bit about sort of non-experimental work, so I'm just going to skip that. I apologize. Magdalena asks, what would you say was the experience from reviewers? Did they understand the format? Did you feel that the additional training reviewers were required over and beyond specific instructions? And I would just add to her, did, did they seem to like it? I would add to that question. Yeah, did you want to say anything? Or? I mean, my, you know, I, I would say, I mean, we used, we used, better quality reviewers, experienced reviewers than we would in general. And our experience, I think, was very positive. They were curious about the process. They had been experienced at RCTs. They kind of knew why we were doing it. Um, so they had sometimes asked us questions, but, but as, you know, our yield was higher than average, um, not surprisingly, I think. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think they were surprised at how hard it was, right? So, I'm not sure, you know, enjoyed is quite the right word, but they felt it was a learning experience. And so they were willing to participate. And no, you know, I don't think anybody said, I'll never do this again. <laughs> I agree with most of that, except for kind of, a, it seemed to be a little bit harder than we expected to get people to review. But apart from that, reviewers did a good job. Um, they did exactly what they should have done. Um, they focused on the right questions um, that, we, that were also in the materials um, that we gave out. So. That was worked perfectly. And to corroborate what Andy and, and Irenius said, we, we did speak to with some of the authors after su their sub uh, submitted about their experience at the JDE. And probably the, the most positive line of feedback was that the, um, the, the, the feedback that they received from reviewers was in much more constructive, you know, very constructive tone because you know you don't have really have any results to shoot down at, at stage one so I guess I guess that's why uh, it, it made it much easier to reviewers to provide actually useful actionable feedback uh, 
All right, I would just like to say um, thank you very much for your participation. Um, panelists, thank you very much for sharing your experiences and recommendations um, and opinions on, on how the format's going so far and your recommendations for the future. Um, everybody attending, thank you very much. Thank you for um, logging on for uh, submitting your questions. There are a couple of questions that we'll try to answer in written format um, at a later date. So, or, uh, we'll make sure that these materials are available, the recording um, and any slides that are available we'll share with the group. Thank you very much and have a great morning, evening, wherever you are. Take care, bye-bye. Awesome, thanks everyone.